Welcome once again to Seattle Civil War Legacy. We are here today in a very, very unlikely location for Civil War history. Um, we are in Seattle's east side in a northeast suburb of the city called Kirkland. Um, you can obviously see it's a very busy, active uh, suburban neighborhood. Here we've got our typical Starbucks, busy street full of car dealerships and Petco and McDonald's and you name it. Uh, just, just a typical busy suburban uh, neighborhood in this area. And it is most certainly not the place anyone would ever consider that you would want to come and look for Civil War history. Um, but much like uh, Seattle Civil War history in general, uh, things will often surprise and things are often unexpected and here we're on the corner of Northeast 120th Avenue and Northeast 85th Street um, we are just one block away just up here wedged in between this busy street and the Kirkland High School at the top of the hill is the Kirkland Cemetery um, and in that cemetery we have 20 Civil War veterans uh, 40 that lived in the city of Kirkland, for, more than 40, but, but 41 that I've confirmed that live in the city of Kirkland uh, in the decades after the war. Um, and 20 of them were actually died and buried here in Kirkland. So um, we're going to go meet some of them uh, as this page progresses. But today we're going to meet one in particular um, and discuss a very unique year that this soldier had in 1863 with the 105th Ohio Infantry. So. In this very unlikely and unexpected spot in Kirkland, Washington, east of Seattle, busy suburban neighborhood, uh, in the midst of all of this, we're going to go a few steps up the hill here and introduce you to Robert C. Porter, Company A, 105th Ohio, and talk about what he did in 1863. Let's go. Okay, so we've come up the hill about 300 yards from where I was at last time down there at the Starbucks. Um, we're still right here in the heart of this residential neighborhood. Uh, busy street, as you can tell. Um, I think this is generally considered the Rose Hill neighborhood of Kirkland. But just here across the street, we'll take a look at the entrance to the Kirkland Cemetery. Really looks like any, any cemetery you'd see in any other sort of mid-sized city like this um, and you might not be inclined to think there's a lot of uh, Civil War history here but there certainly is so just take a look here where the entrance is kind of nice little spot but it's nestled in between the high school right up there at the end of the block where that car just passed um, here's the cemetery through here it extends a small block to the west uh, from the entrance here where I'm standing. Uh, and then one more block past that is the I-405 interstate. And then just down the hill here to the north is the busy 85th street. So here's the location of the cemetery, the entrance. Um, and let's take a walk in and go meet Robert Porter and we'll talk about him a little bit. So here we are inside the cemetery. There's the entrance there. Oh pan around here towards it's an active cemetery there's still people being buried here to this day but uh i'll pan around to the center area of the cemetery here this is where most of the older graves are this the uh more kirkland pioneers uh you can see just under the base of the cedar tree there's a obvious civil war veteran with the veteran's headstone and the shield that's stephen shaw company f of the 49th wisconsin um, we have a little maintenance crew here today with their leaf blowers um, and then there's older stones and graves all throughout here. And the Civil War veterans here are not necessarily easy to find. They don't all have obvious veterans headstones like this one in front of me. Um, some of them just have regular uh, style grave stone markers from the period of when they died, you know, the uh, early 1900s, between 1900 and 1925. Um, so anyway, this is the cemetery a little bit. Um, just give you a peek around and like I said, we're kind of nestled here in between 85th Street to the south, I-405 just a block to the west, uh, the high school just here uh, to the south, sorry, 85th is to the north. Um, 
those bleachers right there, that's the high school football stadium uh, and baseball field. So this is definitely a place that flies very, very much under the radar. So if you don't know they're here, you're not going to find them uh, unless you're looking. And that's what I'm hoping to, to help here is that we can uh, make sure people still stay aware of these guys and what they did and the, the histories they have and the histories they brought to Kirkland and Seattle in general. Um, so let's go meet Robert Porter. And just off the road here, right among the cedar trees, this marker is the gravesite of Robert C. Porter. Um, I'm not going to get too into Porter's whole life history and uh, what he did. Safe to say that he was here in the early 1900s in Kirkland. Um, one of the censuses show him as a boiler man. Um, Sorry, a furnace man. So I'm assuming he is involved in, uh, you know, furnaces, heating, repair, sales, who knows. Uh, at that point, um, there's not a lot on him, but um, we'll investigate that later. He enlisted pretty young, 1862 at the age of 18. Um, he served in Company A, 105th Ohio Infantry. Through the duration of the war, he mustered out in... June of 1865 in Washington, D.C., so he was part of um, Sherman's army at the Grand Review um, and then was, was discharged and went home after that. Um, but the reason we're here to talk about him is because of, he had a very, very uh, unconventional and interesting year in 1863. Um, and what really I found kind of captivating is that he went from being prisoner to being a captor, I guess, in the same year, and then both of those in a very unconventional way. So what happened with, with Robert to start with is in January, late January of 1863, um, a detachment of the 105th of about, I believe it's about 140 men, uh, were detailed for a forage expedition. Um, so the Union Army would send wagon trains and troops out into the surrounding countryside around where they were encamped to gather um, from the farms and things, uh, people in the general area, uh, supplies for the horses and the mules of the army. They weren't At that point, they wouldn't forage for food for the army, but they would forage for food and sustenance for the animals. Um, so that was the main mission of this foraging expedition that the men were sent on. Um, and from the start, it didn't really go particularly well. Um, this particular group, about 140 men, there was 35 wagons. Uh, and the way it was phrased is that they were what's called a loading party. Um, so they would go out four to a wagon with the troops when they found the forage that they were going to bring back, these troops, their whole job was to uh, get out of the wagons, load the stuff on the wagons, and get out of there. Um, and there was a larger detail of force that was um, going to be sent on this expedition, but the particular detail of these men from the 105th and the 34 wagons were sent first. They arrived at the brigade headquarters for this detail, for this assignment. Um, and they were under the company, or sorry, under the command of a captain from the 105th. And when they arrived at brigade headquarters, the, a colonel, uh, I don't know the name of who, who was the one that assigned this task, sent them on the recommendation of the wagon master to sort of go ahead of the larger foraging expedition and its supporting infantry. Uh, because the wagon master knew of a really good store of stuff. It wasn't that far away. Um, it was within or close to the extended picket lines of the Union forces. So they felt that they could get out there real quick, get the stuff, and get back uh, without any trouble. And that didn't happen. So they were sent out under the command of this captain. The men went into the wagons in their typical um, loading party arrangement, which was in the wagons um, with the weapons, but unarmed and unloaded not unarmed, but unloaded. Uh, if they were loaded, the rifles were uncapped. Bayonets were sheathed um, because they had had several incidents already in the war where 
going along in the bumpy wagons, a loaded rifle would miss fire, and, you know, there was problems from that. So here we have 140 men of the 105th Ohio um, loaded into wagons, unloaded weapons, uh, without any kind of support or guard detail. Um, I think there was maybe a couple cavalrymen at the front of this column, and they took off at a trot to get out to the extended cavalry pickets um, and then retrieve this, this supposed forge that the wagon master had, had recommended to the colonel that they rush out there and get. So on their way out, they were making pretty good progress. At one point, they hit a rise in the road, um, and up at the top of the rise, they heard a couple of shots. Um, they saw some federal cavalry kind of riding up and down uh, alongside the wagons in blue overcoats. And when they had asked these these troopers on the horses what, what was going on and what they should do, um, the troopers being actually Confederate cavalrymen under the command of John Hunt Morgan, um, their advice to the inquiry of the troops in the wagons as to what they should do was surrender. And of course they did because they were hopelessly um, undefended and surrounded by this ambush of Confederate cavalry troops. And so that's how that ended. Uh, the drama continued long after um, as far as court martials and discharges and other things about the uh, sort of command chain that led to this unprotected wagon train full of half a regiment of Ohio troops went out and got captured. They um, were held captive for about two days. They were then signed, the officers were kept prisoner. Uh, the enlisted men were released. I don't think the, these Confederate cavalry under Morgan uh, wanted to have to maintain all these guys, so they, they sent them back. They paroled them, sent them back into the lines. Uh, kind of on their own, and General Thomas then did not recognize the validity of the parole because they had violated the exchange agreements. Um, they weren't delivered under the cartel between the governments that had already been arranged. They were just kind of sent off, um, so they were immediately put back into service. Um, you know, no worse for the wear. I don't think there was any actual casualties. Uh, there wasn't wasn't any exchange of fire. They were just captured, the wagons, mules, everything were taken, um, and the Union enlisted men were sent back. And so that's how Robert Porter's 1863 began as a prisoner in January uh, in a really unusual and kind of almost silly circumstance uh, that these men were put in this position and um, it just, you know, ended exactly how, <laughs> when you read it in the history, you, you read how it began and you just assume, uh oh, that's that's how that's going to go, and it did. So let's, uh, I'm going to take you into a close look here at Robert Porter's stone, and then we'll tell you about the second half of 1863. Now, Porter's gravestone is entirely illegible at this point. Um, it's covered in lichen. Um, you can see at the, I'll just kind of scan down here at the whole front. You can sort of see the faintest writing down here at the bottom. That very bottom line says 140. 5th Regiment, Ohio Infantry, Company A. Um, his name is right about here in the middle. You can see there's a R-O-B. Uh, it's really hard to read. So um, this is one that clearly gets missed as a Civil War veteran, um, or as anything, really. I have seen a photograph of, um, of this marker before it really became lichen-covered like this. Um, and this is not moss. This is not something you can just just uh, use some cleaner on and scrub off with the brush. Uh, lichen is, is requires a really, really strong like, wire brush to remove it. So unfortunately, I think this, this stone is going to remain this way. Um, I can't see any situation where um, this, an amateur certainly is going to clean this up and make it legible uh, without ruining it. So if you're here, and you want to come visit. He's right by the road here. Um, like I said, he's in the previous video, right next to the football stadium. Uh, and the, the grave is essentially looks anonymous, almost for the most part. Uh, there's some other veterans 
Civil War veterans right in this area too. You can see this veteran stone right there. Uh, and there's, there's a number of others. But Robert Porter being here and who we're talking about, and we're talking about 1863 for him. So the second half of 1863, September, uh, the 105th was involved in the fight at the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, it's generally viewed as one of the most significant battles of the Western theater of the Civil War. Um, the 105th played a really interesting role and one of the things that's notable is that this is where Robert Porter had the opportunity to be the captor instead of the captive. And the 105th is part of a large number of soldiers, including an Illinois regiment, who all claim to have been the troops that captured Confederate General Adams at the war. Um, they're is no shortage of people claiming to have captured him. Um, so when you read accounts, you know, you always read it with a, the skeptical eye as to uh, the validity of the account. But there's, there's a number of 105th Ohio soldiers who, who make claims to having had captured the general or had some, some role in his capture. And Robert is among them. Um, he wrote into the National Tribune in the late 1890s, I believe, maybe early 1900s. I don't know exactly when the account was offhand. Um, disputing an Illinois regiment's claim about having captured General Adams. And he gets really specific in the details um, as far as who was there, what they did. Um, the regiment was ordered into this, this charge some people say sort of a suicidal charge, I guess, across the Poe field to um, prevent Confederate troops under Georgia troops under General Benning from, from sort of flanking that point of the Union line as it was sort of falling apart and collapsing. And as part of this, after they went through the field, and he, he refers to the fact that they went through 500 yards of wooded terrain um, before they were sort of ordered to move out by the right flank and then head to the rear. And in the process of that, they, he's, he claims that they scooped up about 30 Confederate prisoners, including the wounded General Adams. Um, there's a claim by the surgeon, or a surgeon of the 105th, that he was the one that treated the wounded General Adams. That's been a little bit uh, disputed and debunked by modern historians. Um, but the claims other claims involving the 105th and General Adams seem to sort of hold some water. And the claim by Robert Porter seems to be among them that, that has a pretty strong case. He refers to the order given by General Joe Reynolds for the unit to move out. Um, next to him was the commander of the 105th, who was the man who gave the order to Robert Porter. And the sergeant major who was with him was also, the first name was Porter. Uh, maybe that's why they're selected for the job of hauling this, this guy as a passenger because they're both named Porter. Um, but anyway, they hauled him to the rear on a stretcher. Um, and he, he, he details that a little bit. And in part of checking on that, I spoke with, with my friend Lee White, who is a ranger and historian at Chickamauga. And he said this seems to think that that's, it, there's a very reasonable possibility that this, is, this story is accurate. Uh, the General Adams was, in fact, uh, probably the most captured Confederate general of the entire war. And the reason why, um, first of all, he was wounded pretty severely in the shoulder. And secondly, uh, that he was a really big guy. And he, in total, from where they think he was initially wounded to where he was uh, put on a horse and moved to the rear um, by, again, another member of the 105th Ohio um, is that he was moved on the stretcher as far as you know two men could carry him until fatigue and then probably set down and then picked up by another detail of men and so on and so forth so even though there's many many who claim to have moved this general um, the fact that the Robert Porter and the sergeant major of the 105th claim in the paper to have done it that that seems pretty likely so kind of interesting that he would have gone from being a captive uh, captured by John Hunt Morgan's Confederate Raiders while he was 
sitting in a wagon with his rifle unloaded and uh, sort of helpless, held prisoner for a couple days, released, went on to go through the rest of 1863 and the Tullahoma campaign and the lead up to, Ch to Chickamauga uh, with the 105th, and then to find himself um, the captor of a Confederate general just nine months later into his service. Um, so it's quite an interesting contrast and it's quite an adventure in the life of this one uh, single soldier who is here quietly, um, unnoticed in a grave marker that you can't even read anymore here in the suburbs of Kirkland, Washington. And it just gives you a hint of the, the history that's contained by these soldiers, the, the history that they brought here. Um, part of this page, the mission is to discuss their history here, which is infinite and incredibly significant to this city's history and this area. In, I mean, the whole, all of the American West, but I really focus on Seattle and the surrounding suburban towns and, and out into King County. Um, but also part of it that's, that's fascinating and really underpinned the beginning of this page was that these soldiers brought these war histories here with them and um, you know it was it was a significant part of their lives a lot of people think that these guys came here and they left it in the past and they were looking for a fresh start and that is simply not the case um, you know you read a lot of their accounts and their discussions and the organizations and the things that's in the newspapers and the war and its history and their roles in it and how that affected their uh, outlooks and what they did here is all intertwined so when we look at a veteran like Robert Porter, we have to remember, um, you know, that, that everything that led up to his being here in Washington and being a furnace man in Kirkland in 1910, um, you know, was all a, a result of what had happened earlier in his life and led up to that and led to the people coming out here and, um, you know, thinking about that history as it relates to what happened later uh, is, is something I really want to focus on with this page. And so we'll bounce back and forth between the history here and, and dip back into the military history during the war and, uh, you know, see if we can't mesh the two together and, and keep it interesting for everybody. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Um, we'll talk about these guys a lot. Um, there's, like I said, there's 20 of them, I think maybe 21 right here in Kirkland. Uh, speaking of 1863 in Chickamauga, um, in the far corner, way over there, the very last grave in the very corner of the cemetery, right under the shadow of the football field and the busy streets, um, is a captain from the 72nd Indiana Mounted Infantry, which was part of Wilder's Lightning Brigade of Mounted Infantry, which was enormously significant at Chickamauga. Um, and I do believe he may be the only non-Pennsylvania soldier in the Seattle area who directly has his name on a Civil War monument on a battlefield. Um, uh, his, his name is Andrew Klepser, and Captain Klepser's name is on the Wilder Brigade monument which is i think well as far as i know one of the most popular monuments at chickamauga and his name is actually on it for his action there um, and then we do have some pennsylvania gettysburg veterans here in the area um, and they of course have their name on the pennsylvania memorial on the gettysburg battlefield which includes all the names of of all the soldiers who were engaged at gettysburg um, so robert porter here he doesn't have his name on any monuments he had a pretty interesting war, and especially in 1863, he got to know what it was like to be captured and then turn around and he get to experience what it was like to capture someone, especially a Confederate general. And uh, as you can see here, uh, if I angle the camera just right, you can kind of see the inscription there at the bottom of the 105th Ohio. But uh, for the most part, he's, he's a pretty forgotten bit of history here. And he's right here in Kirkland, right off I-405, right off Northeast 85th Street, here in this quiet little historic cemetery. So if you're around here, um, there are other historians who really specialize in Kirkland history. 
Um, and I know they do an annual tour of the cemetery uh, and talk a lot about Kirkland city history. So I would recommend that if you're watching this video and you, you want to learn more about Kirkland and, and the people here. Um, but I will come back from time to time and we'll discuss the, the veter Civil War veterans in particular. Um, like I said, we'll come back and visit Andrew Klepser um, and we'll talk about him. The uh, Lightning Brigade is, is a very, very worthwhile topic of discussion. Um, guys like this veteran here, Stephen Shaw of 49th Wisconsin. We can talk about him. And the other 17 or 18 veterans that I have not even mentioned that are here. All right, I'm going to sign off. This was Kirkland and this was Robert. C. Porter of the 105th Ohio's. Very interesting 1863. Hope you enjoyed.